This episode is brought to you by Canopy. Canopy Canopy.us backslash classical. Hello and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a podcast about old things, books, ideas, philosophy, and that's it. Those are actually the only topics we'll talk about. Anything else gets an immediate red flag and we have to end the episode early. We did an episode on a painting once. That happened once a long time ago. Yep. Sam. In galaxy far, far I away. think my next one is going to be a painting. Is that actually true? I'm done with reading. No, no. You, you still owe us Genghis Khan from, I don't know, a year ago? I, I can't do that until summer. Oh, because there's so much to read? Yeah. Oh, okay. Plus, everyone it's told huge. us there's like a really good Genghis Khan Pond podcast out there. There already is, yeah. I mean, so. there's, I feel like there's better podcasts for all of, I mean. No, why would you say that? Literally, our podcast we're is the best. a minute in. Why would you say that? <laughs> My name is Thomas Magby. I am joined as always by Mr. AJ Hannenberg. That's me. And Mr. Graham Donaldson. There is no better podcast. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Graham, there is no better podcast Donaldson. That's yeah. what we always call him around the school. Uh, <laughs> That would be very strange if we did that. Okay, uh, today's episode is uh, from uh, AJ. So AJ, this is, I believe, a part, it's either part two or part three. D- depends how you want to splice it. It depends how you want to splice it. Uh, but we're going to keep on with our uh, series on education and why everyone should go get a PhD, right? <laughs> why, isn't that, have I, have I been following the theme of these episodes? Um, I don't know about you, Thomas. I read Faustus. Yes. Did you, you read Faustus. Yeah, naturally. Hannibal yeah. <laughs> read Faustus. Uh, well, we... Everyone knows that whenever we do an episode, we've all read the book. Correct? Yeah, of yeah, course. Naturally. We do. Good. Okay. All right. So, what <laughs> good you, talk. Good talk. What do you guys remember from our last episode on Faust? Our first episode was on Marlowe. Christopher Marlowe's Fa- Dr. Faustus, yeah. which is okay. It's You can read it and yep. then you'll be done. <laughs> Did you just give permission to our read, uh, our listeners to read? Uh, but I, I mean, my point is like, once you're done reading it, you will have finished reading it and that's <laughs> what you will have done. And it's, that's what? about just all you can do with that one. Oh I, man. I can hear like all the Dr. Faustus fanboys yeah, like, just, know, just yeah. hating on us really hard. Yeah. It's not that great. It's okay. How dare you? This is part three, technically of my Faust series and probably the final installment. And this is part two of my series on <laughs> Faust by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Part Man. two of the second section. So, so hard part to follow. Three. It's like you need a PhD to follow this <laughs> That's thing. That's exactly right. There. You, <laughs> There's the tie-in. You might think so. The funny thing is this is also in two parts. And then yes. the second part is five acts. And oh, the first geez. part, I think, might be five acts. Yeah. I forget that many acts. I remember uh, Mephistopheles was a dog. That's a thing that happened. Yeah, Mephistopheles was a dog. All right. So what do you remember from the first part? <sighs> it set a bar on fire, I think. Set a bar on fire? Well, there's like this dude and he's kind of sad. And... Uh, meets a devil or oh, meets Mephistopheles and so meets a devil meets a demon. I don't know what's the right terminology. Sorry to all of our demon listeners. He's, he's both. He's, he's both. a devil okay. demon. Yeah. Um, and uh, enters into a kind of agreement, right? That mm-hmm. if uh, Dr. If Mephistopheles can help or make Dr. Faustus feel it was either satisfied or happy. It was some satisfied. satisfied if he ever yeah. feels the satisfaction, if he ever thinks of yeah. this moment, like, Oh, I wish this moment would go on and the, he stops his toil and his searching. Then, then, then Mephistopheles has won, and he can take um, Faustus, Faustus' soul. Yep. So they they start trying, and we didn't. I don't think we got very far into the attempts, but it, we didn't. Yeah, <clears throat> and that's the one Graham talked about. Of they go to a bar and they try singing and almost cut off some noses. Well, one of the first things they do is knock his age down a little bit and kind of <laughs> open him back up to youthful love. Right? right. When we first meet him, he's an he's a jaded, aged academic and he sort of it was during this period when you can kind of figure out everything in that in the academy and he learned just about everything there was to learn and he was like well that's not as cool as i thought it was going to be and yep. then he it, it is in that despair that ennui and boredom with life that he is met by mephistopheles who basically says i will bring you this satisfaction that you are searching for in yep. fact Right before he meets Mephistopheles, he is just about to commit suicide after realizing that he can't get what he wants. And then the bells of Easter revive him back into life for a little while, but he's still not really happy. And then Mephistopheles and him make this deal. So the first thing they do is they knock his life down about 30 years, and you can see him kind of opening up to love as he stares into a mirror in this little witch's cottage where they're going through this process. And then as they're walking around after that, you know, they go to a bar and set a bar on fire, but... 
of course, Faust is an academic and he's, a, he's the only thing he wants to do is leave. He's just not, he's not a party boy. Right. And then he meets Gretchen, who is a young, innocent woman, and he falls in love with this Gretchen. And we didn't get really far into the meeting with Gretchen, did we? No. Nope. No. No, we did not. Well, we got, all we said was that Mephistopheles gets like a, a hook into Gretchen by tempting her to like keep treasure for herself, something like that. Yeah. So Mephistopheles kind of knows where buried treasure is. Yeah. He, he just kind of has... You know, he lives underground. He's from hell. He knows where all that stuff is. And so he digs some up and then she, her her mom kind of gives it to the church. The church comes and takes all these jewels that right. are just randomly in her room. And then they try again and they leave the jewels. And this time she hides them and right. keeps them for herself. And this is the first instance we see of Gretchen going from innocent to kind of besmirched. Yes. Right. So they kind of have, they have the hooks in her. And then one of the next scenes is... Like after after sort of the wooing process, right? She is open to this seduction. She kind of likes this new tall, dark stranger. Mm. Uh, and Faust eventually wanders off into the forest to be by himself because he's like, man, I'm just not ready for this. I'm old. Like I'm, This is this youthful love thing. I got all these feelings going on. I don't really know how to do it. And it's then a Memphis, commitment. It's a, it's a lot. It's a lot to handle after you've grown into yeah. old age again. All these surging hormones once oh more. It's fair. And do, you, do, you, do you, maybe? Do you want to be sixteen again? No, not a yeah, chance. Yeah. Well, there no, you go. No, not a chance. Mephistopheles mocks him into submission, and then the, really, they, yeah, kind of. They and and during that period, Gretchen is sort of sitting at home at her spinning wheel, and there's this beautiful love song where oh. she talks about her beloved, and they come back, and they they kind of have a a meeting and they they develop a sexy plan to get together and spend some sexy time together. She's okay. like, if I slept alone, I'd leave my door, you know, I'd leave my door open tonight, right. but I don't, I live with my mom. And they, so they give her a potion to sort of pour in her mom's coffee or whatever she's drinking and it'll knock her out cold and then they can spend some sexy time together, uh-huh. which they do. Uh-huh. The, that scene is sort of skipped over, right? There's nothing really sexually explicit there. There is some sexual stuff that happens later in the play, but that one isn't very, and so they skip over it. And the next scene is Gretchen hanging out at a well with one of her friends. And one of her friends is gossiping about this girl, Barb, who Mm. has a bun in the oven. Barb? Barb. Barbara? Yeah. Yeah. Barb, Barb, Barb has a bun in the oven and it's all around town. And Gretchen, as she walks away is like, I would have felt so bad, but you know, I would have easily mocked this girl early in my life, but now I have sympathy because I too have a bun in the oven. Oh, she knows already that she's, she's got a baby Faustus. I I mean, sure. I'm sure it's a little time later. Okay. Um, and so she has this thing going and she despairs in front of a sad Virgin Mary kind of at the, at the County wall. And then her brother shows up and basically says, well, now you're a prostitute and you're worthless. And I wish you wouldn't shop it around all around town because everybody knows. And how can I even look at you? Wow. And he gets really angry with Faustus and Mephistopheles as they come up and he tries to fight them and they kill him. Dang. The brother? Yeah. Yeah. And as he's dying, he curses, you know, uh, Gretchen and the woman who was supposed to watch over Gretchen and these two fellas. And it's it's not, it's a really heartbreaking scene. And that's, Mm. you know, everybody's feeling pretty low. And then Gretchen is now haunted by guilt. Uh, uh, turns yeah. out, not only did her brother die, but they put a little too much knockout potion in the mom's coffee. Did they kill the mom? And the mom died. Dang. And so Gretchen is trying to go to church and trying to repent, but she is absolutely haunted by this monster guilt and can't bring herself to be okay in church, right? right. She's just hounded by this horrible guilt. Man, this is like one of those like morality tale scared straight movies you used to see right. we'll see in youth group when yeah. you were like 14 yeah. you you'd think <laughs> but the funny thing is the church never comes out looking good oh. in the rest mm. of faust really? this is actually almost a commentary on how guilt is one of the negative parts of christianity right it hounds you and doesn't actually lead you to redemption it doesn't help her hmm. all it does is is hound her and make her life terrible right it doesn't actually move her to any sort of redemption um, and then this is where we get one of these huge, crazy asides. It's called Walpurgis, Valper, I know I'm mispronouncing this. It's know. German, Walpurgis Night. Okay. And so while she is dealing with all of this guilt and all of, you know, her pregnancy and her dead mom and her dead brother, Mephistopheles and Faust go to hang out with some witches on a mountaintop where it's a big conglomeration of the devils and the witches and they all get together and they dance and they drink and they have a good time. I mean, Faustus and has a lot going on. You got to blow off some steam, right? You got to blow off some steam. Yeah, you got to blow off some steam. You got to sure. kind of, well, he's still enamored with exploring new things that he's never had before. And so he shows up and Mephistopheles is like, look, man, I've been to this thing a thousand times. I don't really feel like socializing. I know all these people. And Faust is like, I want to go. And mm-hmm. so they go 
they meet some weird old witches and mm-hmm. Faust ends up dancing with a young witch. And he's like, there's something about her. I kind of like her. And then a red mouse crawls out of her mouth mm. and runs off. And he's like, that was really weird. I don't know <laughs> if I really enjoy this. And it reminds him of Gretchen for some reason. Turns out it was a shapeshifter thing mm-hmm. that co- couldn't hold its shape for very long. And right. then I don't, I don't understand about the mouse. It's not explained very well. She's going to want to get that checked out. Yeah. That, yeah. That seems it seems serious. like a, yeah. like a, a health medical, condition. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so this Walpurgis night thing, it starts with a will-o'-the-wisp leading them through the forest and it kind of confuses their direction and they get all confused about where they are and they sort of end up on the top of this mountain. And this kind of thing will happen throughout Faust where the location is really unclear mm-hmm. and what is happening is really unclear and the time period is really unclear. So I'm going to take a quick aside and talk about now my experience with the rest of the book. I finished it and it took me forever because it is really hard to read, and I didn't really understand it, so I listened to a lecture also in preparation for this episode. It helped a lot. You did some research? Oh, yeah. (laughs) I did did some research. (laughs) So, yeah, I I worked... Should I start doing that? Uh, Wait, (laughs) tell me more about this research. No, that's it's a one-time thing. Never again. Like I said, I'm done with reading. (laughs) Um, So, it's... Apparently, it is one of the hardest and most demanding books in the Western canon, right? It's just below Ulysses by Joyce, oh. apparently. So it's, the, it's it's complicated. It's really hard. And it, it's that was my experience with it, too. Do you guys have any books that you feel wholly unequal to? I, I, this was, I think, over it was either last summer or the summer before I read um, A General Theory of Authority by um, Eve Simone, I believe is the name. Anyway, and just the, every sentence was like, I don't think I understood a word of that. Anyway, it, it's a short book. It's maybe 150 pages, but just took me forever mm-hmm. to get through. Um, Karl Barth. I find Karl mm-hmm. Barth to be oh, really, yeah. really difficult to penetrate. Um, I even took a class on him way back in the day uh, with a wonderful Barth scholar. But uh, and he it's great class. He made it seem super easy and straightforward. Right. And then you read Bart, and it's like, man, you got to go through this slowly. Right. Yeah. And he wrote something like 40 volumes. Yeah. Right. Barth's yes, yeah, insane. Yeah, so Bart is one. I've read some Bart, and you're right. He's incredibly difficult to grasp, and Mm. this is the same. Mm. You guys, I teach ancient Greek literature. Mm. Right. He referenced Greek gods I'd never even heard of, Mm -hmm. like never even entered my radar, Mm. and I read all kinds of old Greek stuff. And there are so many thick references in here, and and sometimes there's no warning, like this is going to be all symbolic for the next 40 Mm. pages, and you're not going to understand any of it because it's all references, and everything is symbol- and then he'll jump right back into Faust and Mephistopheles. There are sections of the book that don't have Meph and Mephistopheles and Faust in it yeah. at all. Mm-hmm. They're not there. Mm-hmm. And then there's so much illusion. There's so much reference, so much symbolism. And even the poetic forms, right? It'll go from uh, hexameter to to versions of old forms to what was in Dante's Inferno. to And even the very fo- poetic form that he chooses tells you something about the passage. Some Sometimes it'll be a Germanic form that only takes place at a dirge, mm. or it'll be a classical form to reference that this person is coming from the Western canon. There's so much going on. I, I think that if I was to give this book its real due, we could have 100 episodes of this podcast on just on this that. book. Sure. Crazy. Yep. Yeah. We could have a Faust podcast and we would still be going. So yeah. just... Which, which I guess is true for a lot of the books we do, right? That... You know, to do one episode on the Odyssey is like, well, we probably could have done a lot more there. This is far. I, I this would say, having more. read both, this is far more complex than the Odyssey. And mm-hmm. something like uh, the picture of Dorian Gray, you, I mean, like it's got a theme. You can kind of right. get it. It's got the story. But this is this is worth a a doctorate's thesis at the least, and probably a lifetime of study. Okay, right. So, audience, if you're out there thinking, so what, are we, what are we doing here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing, audience. If you're out there thinking, man, he really didn't get it. That's probably true. Mm-hmm. And if you're wondering if you should read it, I would say yes. It is a masterpiece. But Please go read it. But you're going to need to take it slow. You're going to have to go into it thinking, kind of like the going into Moby Dick. Right. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a lot of work. It's going to you. You need an annotated version. You have to get an annotated version. I recommend the. I have the Norton Critical, and it helped out a ton. Oh or, man! And with Moby Dick, teacher, like you better same. love whales. Yeah, you better love whales. <laughs> true, In this yeah. one, you better love classicism because yeah. a basic classical background is absolutely necessary. So I was going to ask that. So for the version you read, so they bring in all these Greek gods that you know are obscure. Are they telling you all along the way this is who this is? Nope. Okay. Not at all. So then what are the annotations in there doing? Telling you, oh, the annotations tell you who it is. Oh, that's what I mean. Were were you following the annotations also? Sometimes. Sometimes it was like, this is a a really obscure Greek god that 
up occurs in one text somewhere and sure. he, he brings it up. Right. So some, some sections of this book, I'm just going to jump over because right. it's largely not necessary to the central tale. And it's a lot of symbolism, some of which I really just didn't understand. And in an hour, you're not going to be able to go through all the symbolism, right? It's, it's like too much to one handle. small scene yes. of this symbolism could yeah. easily take us our whole hour. So sure. I'm going to glass over it. Walpurgis night, this night uh-huh. where they're yeah, on get this back mountain. to the mouse, mouse face. Right. Yeah. yeah so Maustus. that's what I'm saying is <laughs> mouse, mouse, the mouse face lady is yeah. one section of Walpurgis night and Walpurgis night spans. I like a ton of pages. Gotcha. It's huge. There's no way I can tell you about all of it. So I'm just, the, the two Walpurgis nights, I'm probably just going to hit in, only in passing. Okay. So he has this crazy night with all these devils. And I, I think I personally spent way too much time in it trying to understand it. And then you come out the other side and you're back to normal and they don't really reference it again. You're like, ah, oh, all right, that's moving on. Uh, so he goes and as they kind of head back to town, he sees that there is a like everything feels kind of weird. Everything's drab after this crazy night party with devils. Which makes I mean, sense. Yeah. How do you, how sure. do you, you know, the morning after a party is totally, never a great totally. morning. And then he finds out that oh, Gretchen. Gretchen has been condemned to die and she is in prison. What? And so Faustus and, or Faust and Mephistopheles go to rescue her from this prison. And Faust is legitimately angry. He says, you had me partying with witches while she was in prison and you knew. And Mephistopheles is like, oh, come on, get off your high horse. You know what's going on. Like you left her after killing her brother and doing all these things to her and it's it's your fault so the crime is well we find out that the crime was drowning her child oh she had her kid he was gone Mm -hmm. she had no support and so she has been condemned and the last scenes of part one of faust are so incredibly arresting in fact she doesn't understand who he is at first. She doesn't recognize him as Faust. She keeps wishing that her lover would show up and he's like, I'm right here in front of you. We have to go. We sprang the doors open. Please follow me. And I want to read you one of her responses. Let's see. He says, she says, is the grave out there? Death ambushed? Then I go with you from here to the eternal resting place. Else not one pace. You're leaving now? Oh, Heinrich, if I could too. And he says, you can, just want to. See, the door is open. Like, come with me. And she says, it must not be. For me, there is no hoping. What use is fleeing? Still they lie in wait for you. I dread the beggar's staff and purse, and a sinner's conscience makes it worse. It's so wretched to err and fall off lands, and still at last I'll fall into their hands. Faust says, I'll stay with you. And she says, quick, run. Save your little one, quick. And she kind of, in this section, is going a little bit insane and remembering her crime. Follow the trail up the river dale, cross on the trunk into the copse, left where the planking stops, into the lake. Snatch it, for God's sake. It hasn't sunk. It's kicking still. Save it. Save. And and she's obviously talking about her great crime. Right. And then Mephistopheles is like, hey, they're going to find us. We got to get out of here, whether she's coming or not. We we need to come. And then he says near the end, come, come, or I'll forsake both her and thee. And Margaret says, thine I am, Father, rescue me. You know, she's, she's in full insanity mode. And Mephistopheles says, she is condemned. And then a single voice from above yells, redeemed. And Mephistopheles says, hither to me. And then the voice is her, Gretchen, yelling Heinrich, Heinrich, as the scene fades. Crazy. So as they leave, it is, right. I wrote, holy crap, what an end to part one. <laughs> Actually <laughs> and, what that says. Yeah. It, yeah, on my big thing. It is it is heartbreaking after the crazy revels of Walpurgis Night, you know, hanging out with witches mm-hmm. and having parties and flying around on brooms. And then he returns to find that this girl that he had abused is literally insane and in jail and he cannot save her. True. Right. So that's the end of part one. So, Hannenberg, I have been inspired by your Dr. Faustus episodes, so much so that I sold the soul of our podcast to a sponsor. We now have our first ever Classical Stuff You Should Know sponsor. It's called Canopy, and it's an app that blocks explicit adult images on kids' phones. So, like lots of kids accidentally stumble across really explicit images and videos online, one study found that twice as many kids had seen pornography as their parents thought. That's crazy. I mean, uh, the internet is a wonderful place, but the internet is also an incredibly dangerous place these days. And I remember um, 
working at other schools with these sorts of blocking software. And most of them were pretty bad and kids could like hack it in like 30 seconds. But anyway, um, Canopy has um, been using this like new technology that with basically robots. It's artificial intelligence and they go through and they detect bad stuff before your kid sees it. So it doesn't actually block the website. Uh, it takes all the stuff that would be explicit on that website. So in the past, like in school projects, you've had a kid who's doing like an anatomy class and they're uh, blocking software. You can't access it. That's a real frustrating thing if you're doing school at home or even if you have some sort of software at a school. But something like Canopy uh, has it where uh, any sort of uh, material that would be deemed explicit just gets removed, uh, but the web page itself, itself stays active. Um, Canopy also lets you block and manage apps and websites, works on Apple, Android, and Windows. And for you classical stuff you should know, listeners, you can go to canopy.us backslash classical. I'll say that again, canopy.us backslash classical. You get 30 days for free, an entire month. You can try it out, see how it works. Um, and you can also get 20% off forever. So canopy.us backslash classical, 30 to free days, 20% off forever. That's pretty awesome. When he was originally interested in Gretchen, did he think it was just a, like, was he just attracted to her? Did he think he was looking for love? Like, what did he go into this relationship? What was he looking for in the first place? I, I think he was newly young and infatuated. Okay. And her innocence really arrested him. And right. Mephistopheles at one point basically says, look, let's be real about this. What, what this is, you are lustful. Right. You, you want her body. Right. Like, let's not mess around. You barely know this girl. But Faustus thinks that he's looking for something else like he thinks it's like a deeper love that he has for her maybe i think he doesn't quite understand love i know mephistopheles doesn't understand love yeah. he he always has a cynical word to say about it mephistopheles is full of jokes always right. full of the jokes and sure. he he doesn't think it's a thing but i mean faust is still searching for that moment that moment of satisfaction sure. right yeah. but he doesn't find it with gretchen sure. and, he, and he moves on right okay you guys ready for part two sure yep that's kind of a heavy note to end on i mean sure is but I mean, like, hey, I mean, what did you think was going to happen? You made a deal with the devil. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, I mean, it's it's the lowest. It is easily the lowest part of Faust's experience, his, yep. his journey here. Okay, part two. I'm going to speed through chunks of this. So it opens up on a charming landscape, and Faust is sort of looking for a way to fall asleep. And he is... Is it immediately after, or is it like time, you know, five months later? I, it doesn't really say. Mm. Here is where time is going to get murky. Gotcha. And things are going to get murky, and we're going to lean more into symbolism. This poem was composed, I think, over the span of 60 years? Jeez Louise. 40, 38, something like that. Long time. Long time. And right. he, probably, he even published them 28 years separate. Mm. Right. So uh, he is a different man when he completes the play than when he begins mm. it. So it opens up in a charming landscape, and he's kind of revived back to life as the sun rises. And then they go and they hang out with an emperor. He's a brand new emperor. He's young, just crowned. And he is still in that place where he thinks he can rule and party at the same time, kind yep. of do both. Turns out, though, that uh, things aren't going well in the kingdom and nobody has any money. As they're kind of standing there talking with this this emperor, a you know, the soldier comes up. He's like, I can't pay any of my soldiers. And the bursar comes up. He's like, we, got, we have no money. And so money is the big problem. Mm -hmm. And so Mephistopheles suggests a solution. And it was the same solution when they were trying to woo Gretchen. Do you remember mm -hmm. what that was? Uh, fine. Buried treasure. Buried yeah. treasure. He oh, says, man. look, King, all the riches you're looking for mm -hmm. are right under here. your feet. Right. We got we got more money than we need. All you got to do is dig it up. Is so really give some people some treasure? shovels awesome. and, yeah. and send them out. Do we need to go look for some buried yeah, treasure? Yeah, like, let's, you know, get... Uh, Call the Fed. Like they can, you know, we got. <laughs> I don't. I don't I think like he's being good. honest. But the emperor says, "Yes, that's great. We'll do the digging after carnival." And so they have oh, good, this big oh, carnival sure. celebration. Faust dresses up. I mean, it's another one of those symbolic things. Everybody's in a mask. There's yep. a lot of symbolic things happening. Faust dresses up as I think P Pluto. Yeah, Pluto, and then he's being pulled around by the embodiment of poetry, and then Mephistopheles is the embodiment of greed. At one point, they throw gold everywhere. People gather it up, but guess what? It's fire! And then it lights mm. everything on fire, and okay. then they put it out. And then so after this party where everything's been on fire, and they're like, wow, you're a crazy magician, they say, well, that thing that we had you sign in, like, while we were wearing masks was a real thing. Basically, without knowing it, you issued paper money. And they, that was their solution to the money problems was they invented, <laughs> Wait, really? they invented paper money. I'm not kidding you. And guess what was, you know, like, so what did we have backing our paper money when we invented it? Gold. Gold. We right. had gold. Yeah. 
Guess what's backing their paper money? Gold. No, buried treasure. Nothing. Buried treasure. Oh, good, even better. That's <laughs> Basically, wonderful. it is a That's, a a you holding that piece of paper is a right to a portion of the buried treasure incredible. that they will find in the future. Oh, perfect. Like oh, that, yeah, no, that works. This is an economics textbook. Yeah. I like this. Yeah, the okay. funny thing yeah. is that this is like it's they walk. It's, kind of, <laughs> it's, it's indeed. It's, <laughs> this is pretty legit. I like this. The funny thing is they walk away and they're like, "Man, we got to get out of here yeah, before they fast. figure out that yeah. ruse." Yeah. But yeah. turns out, like everyone's the economy picks up okay. and apparently the few people who are skeptical and like is this really going to give me some uh-huh. buried treasure they brought it to the kingdom and said hey where's my gold and they they like they scrounged it. up uh-huh. some gold it's almost like a like a ponzi scheme right, sure. so they give those awesome. few people yeah, the two or three that wanted to check it out the gold and then everyone else was like word gets it's out legit. checks yeah. out yeah. seems yeah. legit yeah. and so everyone accepts it even people in other countries <laughs> and so mephistopheles and faust are like we better get out of here before they figure yes. out that there's no buried treasure there for everybody but so it's, the central so bank of the emperor's kingdom yes. was an idea invented by a devil at carnival. That's, that yeah, that's okay. the right takeaway. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So it was also printing more money. That's also <laughs> and, invented by the devil. Yeah. And that's kind of how our economy is currently running. Yeah, sure. Uh, What's yeah. backing our dollar? Nothing. 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 Well, I mean, the full, uh, full, full faith and credit of the U.S. government. That's what backs it. Anyway, fiat sure. currencies are great. Not some party emperor. Not some party. Not some party emperor. So that's fun. I I almost laughed out loud when I realized that was the solution, like the magical solution they had for all of the country's problems was to invent paper money. (laughs) It's a great idea. It's great. Uh, And then the emperor is like, man, that paper money thing was really cool. I would also like to see Helen. Okay. Can you, can you like conjure up Helen for me? That's one thing. Like if you're a magician, you got this whole paper money thing figured out. You're pretty great. Uh Can I also see Helen? Is that a thing that you can do? So Faust goes and and visits the primal what are they called like the eternal mothers or the primal mothers okay mephistopheles won't even accompany him he's like if you're the if you come back you'll be the first person ever that's met those people and come back i'm not even going to join you time is nothing you can't travel there right but go down this hole and see what you can do so he steals wait, wait, their wait. little you're gonna have to catch me up on the whole primal mother thing yeah again remember how i talked about how some of the stuff i just didn't fully understand oh, okay yeah, this is one of those sure. things. I don't really get it. Don't they, know what the problem mothers are. They go somewhere to see these people. Is that the important yeah. part? Okay. Well, he, I think he kind of like pulls a hole open in the floor oh, and he's he like, does. have good luck. Okay, good. Or no, he, he that's right. He goes and gets a key. He goes and gets a special key and then like gives it to Faust and he's like, this will get you to the mothers. I'm not coming. Okay. Hope you don't die. And then he goes and steals. I think it's their, I forget, I think it's a cauldron that they have or a little like a little candle stand. Mm-hmm. Sure. And he's not supposed to take it, but Faust yoinks it, grabs it, and it will let him summon things. And mm. so they have this big play where he summons both Helen and Paris mm. to oh, mix. Oh, so he steals their summoning cauldron. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So he brings it back. Right. And he summons Helen and Paris to mixed reception. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The mixed reception is that when Helen shows up, all the boys are like, oh, man, I wish I could break me off a piece of that. And all the ladies in the audience are like, pfft. Her ankles are fat and like <laughs> make fun of her and try to make her not into a thing. And then when Paris shows up, all the ladies in the audience exactly are like, oh boy, yeah. be still my heart. And all the men are like, yeah, but he's so weak and he doesn't have any scars. And what is this thing? And so the That's mixed funny. reception is just the, the two gender reactions That's to funny. the two manifestations of beauty. And the funny thing is Faust really loves Helen. There you he's go. like, oh man, I summoned her, but now like be still my heart. And so uh-huh. he goes and tries to touch her and guess what happens? She disappears. She literally explodes yeah. like a firework. Wow. <laughs> and then he So she wasn't out. real? She was just the image of Helen? I, th- I think. Okay. Interesting. I think she wasn't real, huh. but now he has, he's got a taste for Helen. And so he's got to have mm-hmm. Helen. We got to okay. figure that out. Sure. Okay. And then. But you're going to want the like non-exploding. Non-exploding. Yeah. The non-exploding That's pretty Helen important. Idea. Yeah. 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 Are, you, are you guys tracking so far? We're tracking. I mean, I'm, yeah. It's pretty weird. Cl- oh, we're well. not even close. <laughs> we're not even close sure. to as weird as it's going to get. Let's go back to the witch dancing. That's the yeah, Oh, yeah. we'll go back. Okay. We're, it's, that's not over. Okay. 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 So Mephistopheles decides he wants to go back and visit Wagner, who was Faust's second in command, right? Uh-huh. The guy who at the very beginning said he was satisfied uh-huh. with books. He liked the intellectual life. He liked being an intellectual. Let's go back and visit him. Right. When he comes back, he actually meets that student that he had first oh. talked to. Oh, that became the doctor? Yeah, that told so him. be like close to ladies? Yeah. yeah, but he's like this jaded intellectual oh now. Oh my gosh. And he, he's kind of like, <laughs> like a, he's, he's kind of a hipster. He sort of hates on everything. And then he's like, the only good thing worth having is youth. When you hit 30, you might as well be dead. Ooh. And then. This is unfortunate. Yeah. And Mephistopheles is like, well, you turned out to be someone I want to hang out with. Not at all. <laughs> and then he goes and finds Wagner. And Wagner was always 
kind of hinted it to be kind of stupid, but turns out Wagner was not, oh. and he's literally creating a homunculus, a life from nothing. That's it's cool. like the ultimate scientific accomplishment. Right. And then they sort of take this homunculus and fly off to classical Walpurgis night. And so they're going into the second crazy witch celebration. But they've got this like life from nothing. He is like a beast. tiny, he's like a tiny dwarf, dwarf right. person that yeah. lives in a vial. He's in a glass. Oh, okay. He's like in a glass beaker and he can glow when he wants, but he's not really anything yet. It's not even a he, it's a potential. It's a mm. potential okay. person. And he's there to figure out how to become what he wants to become. He's like, okay. I don't know what I should be. The homunculus? Yeah. So I want to go check out this crazy Walpurgis night and talk to some philosophers, talk to some witches, maybe okay. some Greek gods and figure out what I'm supposed to be. So he's on like a journey, like a vision quest. He wants to figure out who he is. It's like a, like a, what's that? What's that? What's the the genre of books about growing up and finding uh, com, yourself uh, coming of age? Yeah, well, but they, it's also got a German word for it. Um, um, stories where you come of age about coming of age. I can't remember what it's called. There's the one for the, what's the Harry name Potter? for the one year? <laughs> yeah, Harry Potter. No, it's the one year. This isn't German, but it's the um like the it's not Wanderlust, but you have the year abroad and then come back. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not remembering. Sorry. Like the Amish? Yeah, I'm thinking of the Amish right now. This little guy in the vial? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But then he has like come back to the university at the end of it all. Yeah, yeah. We'll find out. So I'm going to, again, gloss over a huge chunk of Walpurgis Night. Just a few highlights. A volcanic earthquake monster jumps out of the ground um, and then is pummeled into nothing by a piece of the moon that fell off. Naturally. Uh, There is a war between pygmies Uh and cranes. Uh And the pygmies want their feathers for their hats, Uh I think. Uh, and then the homunculus will talk to two philosophers mm-hmm. who both argue about how the world was made from water or from, I think, earth. Okay. Um, eventually, he'll go down to the shore where he'll chat, chat up some sirens and, and Nereus and uh, who's the old man of the sea? What's his name? Proteus. Nereus and Proteus. He'll mm-hmm. chat, chat them both up. And then he'll see a lady in the clam ride by with some ladies on dolphins. And eventually, the homunculus is like the ocean. That's where I will become. And I can... Because that's where kind of evolution happens, right? Mm. Okay. Man has become by gradations, and that's where I'll start. I'll start in the ocean because okay. that's where man did. Mm. So he runs up and he sort of throws himself and his vial against this giant riding shell and dies? Question mark? That's what, Shatters it. And, that's what that sounds like. And right. goes into the sea? There you go. Right. Is that the end of the homunculus? That's kind of a bummer. Well, the thing is, is the next scene is Helen showing up on a beach. The homunculus so becomes Helen. Did the homunculus become Helen? I don't know. Hmm. I got nothing for you. Yeah, that's what that's I'm thinking. Kinda, I don't know. It yeah. seems to imply it, but the thing is, is the Helen that we meet has all of Helen's memories, and she's actually oh. showing up on shore with Menelaus, her husband, hmm. after they are done. He's like done saving her from Troy. Hmm. And so now we come to the, I think it's called the like Heleniad or something. There's a small portion of this book devoted to Helen. Oh, okay. And so now this now is the motion the the moment where we are going to talk about Helen for a little bit. Okay. Are you guys tracking? I told you sure. it's going to get weird. Yeah, this is great. But tracking? I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm able to follow what you're saying. Okay, I'll try to I'll try to bring <laughs> yeah, it all together at sure. the end as best I can. You can see why this took me. I had I think like 120 pages last night to finish. It took me like eight hours. Yeah, it's good. It's good because I I was like I would read and I was like, so what did the Literally, homunculus yeah, just do? Exactly. And where did he come from? And I had to go back. Anyway, so Helen is on the shore, and Menelaus says, "Okay, I want you to go inside. Mm-hmm. I want you to get yourself so, like a knife. I want you to get all the the tapestries and stuff that we need for sacrifice, a cauldron, all that stuff. Off you go." And he doesn't tell her what the victim is going to be. He didn't say okay. grab a chicken. He didn't say grab a bull or anything. And so right. she walks in and Mephistopheles is there, but he's disguised as an old crone with one eye and one tooth because he borrowed them from a trio of witches during Walpurgis night. Yeah, naturally. Yeah, naturally. Well, he, I mean, he more like tooth? gave, gave up his oh, to gotcha. them because they only had one. Okay. And so he looks like this old crone and a serving woman. And he convinces Helen hmm. that Menelaus didn't tell her a victim because he was going to sacrifice her. Oh. And so Helen is terrified of Menelaus. And he says, look, all you have to do is want to come with me. I can get you out of here. And I guess the, what the deal was is he was going to bring her to Faust, but she needed to do it willingly. And mm. so she says, yes, I will go with you. Mm. And so everything becomes real dreamy and misty. And then floop, they pop out at a castle that apparently belongs to Faust. Oh, okay. So now they show up. Like a time travel thing? So That's what on? it sounds like. Sure. Yes. Sure. Yeah, okay. Question mark? I think so. So she shows up and obviously Faust looks real good mm-hmm. and she goes in. She's like, who is this guy who owns this castle? Look at him so regal, such mm-hmm. nice clothes. And he's feeling very proper and she's looking real hot. 
And then he brings the a watchman with him and he says, you've arrived just in time. I was about to put this watchman to death because you showed up and it was his job to tell me if someone was coming, especially a guest, so I could prepare for them, right? So you can decide what happens to this poor youth. And she says, well, poor youth, what's your defense? And his basic defense is, I'm really good at my job, but you are so dang hot that I got lost in looking at you and forgot to go tell sure. Faust that you were coming. And she says, well, all right, I'm not going to. That must happen a lot for Helen. Yeah, right. really. Honestly, I mean, yeah, it, yeah. it happens several it times point, in this book right. itself. Yeah, yeah. So she says, all right, you're off the hook. And he's like, woo. And so he runs <laughs> off. And then turns out somehow either, I'm not sure if Menelaus was actually coming, but Mephistopheles says that he is coming mm. and we better get out of here because mm. he's going to come and take Helen back. So we got to leave. You're in a castle. Well, that's a good point. But not he did, anymore. Like, raise Troy. Now yeah. they're in a forest. Oh, okay. Uh, Rock and roll. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> it ha- it, I, I, that, sure. While sure. that felt abrupt, the yeah. same abrupt thing happens in the scene because at some point Faust goes, this is the wrong place for you, a castle. You would fit much better in the verdure of a forest. And so, poof, they're, they're in a forest. Yeah, sure. Hmm. So he's in a forest. They spend some time in a cave and have a kid. Okay. Instantly. It all happens instantly. They spend the time in the cave. The kid is born. And somehow he is a an active youth that I think is supposed to be the, the embodiment of poetry. Okay. So he comes out. And he's like leaping around and having games. And they're like, hey, would you settle down a little bit? We, we really don't want you to die. And he's like, no, I'm going to jump around some more. And so he jumps around, jumps into this ravine. And they're like, oh, no. And then he comes out and he's like playing a guitar. And then okay. I, I'm, I'm not making this stuff up. And then he's like, you know what? I would like war. And they're like, that's a bad idea. And he's yeah. like, no, mom, I'm going to climb this mountain. I'm going to do some war. And then he climbs this mountain, takes a dive off the mountain flies for a second, but Looney Tunes style then plummets to his death. Oh. And the dead body looks maybe like Lord Byron. Okay. And then he becomes a meteor and shoots into the sky. (laughs) (laughs) I I like this book. I like this a lot. I don't know what I was expecting from this episode. Nothing that's happened is what I expected. This is incredible. I feel like there was a couple of years where I had a short story assignment that I gave to my 10th graders. (laughs) And uh, this is just a collection of all those. And a couple of them would do it the night before. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. uh, this was like what I got. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah. So you guys, you understand why I didn't, I couldn't really make heads or tails of it. Yeah. And it was taking me a long time. That's why I was like, wait, he's Lord Byron. Wait, <laughs> he's a meteor. meteor? Yeah. Uh-huh. What? Yeah. And then Helen is really sad that her kid is dead. That, Euphorian. Okay. Sure. His name is Euphorian. And she's like, oh, that's sad. Well, I'm going to say goodbye too. And then she dies after oh. hugging Faustus, Faustus. Faustus okay. and becomes mist. Just like that? And then lifts him into the sky. And so he is now flying in his cloud Helen mist machine. Know. Okay. Sure. And he flies around a bit. Okay. And then <laughs> he kind of gets plunked down on some mountains. Okay. And then the cloud splits into to two, and then one kind of goes off and becomes a giant woman on the mountain, and the other one stays and cools his brow. Oh, and I, I read the symbolism. It's supposed to be, I think, the the large one on the mountain is is Helen, and then the one that is staying and cooling his brow is Gretchen. Like it's manifestations of the two women he's been involved with. Okay. Um, audience, I know this is really crazy. I'm hoping to bring this back to some useful discussion at the end of the episode. Stay with me. We're almost we're almost home. Fun note about the mountains, Mephistopheles says, hey, you know how these mountains were made? And he's like, uh, natural process? <laughs> right. And he goes, nah. Tectonic plates. <laughs> Devil burps. Oh. And he's like, what? And he's like, oh, yeah, we got shoved down into this tiny space after we were kicked out of heaven. Uh-huh. And man, devils are a gassy bunch. And so we were like farting and burping and the gas itself like pushed the mountain up and then that's how we got out and so now we're the princes of the power of the air but we used to be stuck in a little hole down there but Mm -hmm. we made a lot of the mountains by burping and he's like well that's not true and mephistopheles is like yeah i was there i i know (laughs) i had to live through the stink this is real yeah this is a real thing okay so then he says all right you've dated helen Uh uh-huh you have invented paper money. Uh-huh. You had a girl. You went to a bar. Uh-huh. You've literally flown through the air on mist. You had a son. Two of them, actually. Okay. And two pretty rad parties. Two yeah. crazy witch parties. Uh, you literally met a half person that was going to become a person. <clears throat> what more do you want? And I, th- I think he was like, you know what I want? 
I want the power of the sea. <laughs> I want to subdue <laughs> sure. the waves. Okay. And he's like, how about instead we go back to the emperor, you know, the one we yeah. made the paper money for? He's got this whole war brewing. We uh-huh. could do that a little bit. Yeah. And oh. Faust is like, sounds legit. So they go... <laughs> And they, really? He gets yeah. talked out of it? That yeah, they, okay, he, he just kind of gets talked out of it. So they go to the emperor pretending to be the... So the paper money led to like international conflict? That's exactly right. Well, yeah. uh, not international conflict, civil conflict. Oh, mm-hmm. even, yeah, even there you worse, go. Right? He, yeah. he sucked at ruling and now there's a, a contrary emperor that's sort of coming up and challenging his throne. And so they go like, hey, we'll help you out. We are the wards of a sorcerer you saved right after you were coronated. Okay. And he's like, okay, I saved that guy. He seemed cool. Okay. You guys seem nice. Uh, I'm not going to make you in charge of my armies, but do whatever wizardry you're going to do. Sounds, sounds like a good idea. So they come up with all these little plans. They Mm -hmm. make imaginary water around the other army. Mm -hmm. And so every, the whole other army thinks they're drowning, even though they're fine. They're not drowning. They just, they just, they like think that they are air paddle on land. And then like some sparks and then the sound of weapons and it freaks everybody out. And so they win. (laughs) And okay, and in thanks, the emperor gives a bunch of land. Are you making all of this up? No, I, I, would, I, I would love to find I out. Swear, that you've I am not. With us for an I hour, sw- I, just, I couldn't. I <laughs> given the time I had, I couldn't make the, all this stuff up. This is in one of the greatest works of literature I've ever read, and I still maintain it's great. This is a masterpiece. Great. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Graham, AJ, before we go any further, I want to thank our patrons for making this episode possible. Uh, those are uh, patrons are on patreon.com slash classical stuff. Wanted to give a little information on how anyone could sign up if they are so inclined. I guess the first thing that is most exciting is that we are dropping the cost of our lowest tier. Currently that's at $5 a month going down to $2 a month. What a steal at $2 a month. Patrons get ad free episodes. So if you're on Patreon, you aren't even listening to this right now. So sorry about that. At $10 a month, you get access to our in-between episodes, which we record after every single episode. We also have a monthly AMA. That means that means ask me anything, but there are three of us, so it's an ask us anything. I never really understood. AUA. How. AUA. AWA. <laughs> our monthly AWA. So that's at the $10 a month tier. And at $20 a month, we uh, those are our Aristotelians, for they are truly... Uh, among the best of us at $20 a month uh, is where we start asking for ideas on episodes and where we start asking for ideas on the type of merchandise that we should be producing. Um, And you get to help shape the direction of the podcast, which is great. But after overwhelming feedback, we are unlocking a brand new tier. Are we not Hannenberg? Oh, we are indeed. And what is that tier? Uh, Well, we're opening up 30 and only 30 spots for a Helios's Acolytes of Love tier, which is at $100, we will make you a red crew neck sweatshirt with the big yellow sun on it that says H-A-O-L on it, Helios as Helios's Acolytes of Love. We'll buy you a pair of Crocs of the color of your choice and we'll sign them and send them to you. It also entitles you to one of every piece of merch we make from here on out for free. So if we issue a new t-shirt, you get that for free. New mugs? Free mug, all Pro- that. Provided they're still subscribing. Provided they're oh, yeah, still yeah, subscribing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah, not yeah, a one hundred dollars. You know, if you're you if you're still that. in yeah. the tier, then yeah, yeah, you yeah. you get the merch. Yeah. Because that is our gift to our most faithful acolytes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, not ours. Not no, our. Not ours. Let's be not very our, clear. I don't, let's be clear. Did, did we actually start a cult? <laughs> well, speaking of joining a cult, you can find us on <laughs> Patreon.com at patreoncom slash stuff. We hope that you will join us there. Thank you all to our patri- uh, to our patrons for supporting us and for making this episode possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the the emperor appoints his main dudes, and then the bishop comes in and he's like, "Hey, um, you're allied with the devil, okay? Yes, and I know that. So the way that you're going to get out of it is by building us a cathedral okay. and giving us all the taxes on a certain chunk of land." And the emperor's like, "Fine, might as well sign away the whole realm now that I'm the emperor." So again, the church not being the coolest, right? And he gives Faust a little section of land by the coast. And this is where the final drama of the play will happen. Okay. So Faust does begin to subdue the power of the sea. He builds these big dikes. He pushes. So he didn't didn't give up that dream. He didn't give up that dream. It's his final dream. (laughs) Okay. And so he, he builds this little thing and then he pushes the water further and further out. It's like symbolically it is supposed to be him extending human culture against nature. Ah, right. He's creating his own little Eden. And next space (laughs) (laughs) that would be great the final frontier yeah with tesla okay 
So he, he creates this little Eden. He's got this big, beautiful castle. He is ruling in defiance of everybody, but there's this one old couple that lives on the land up there that he, he told them they could live there. He said, you didn't have to leave. They used to live right on the coast. Now they don't anymore because he moved the coast. Right. And he's like, man, it's a, I hate their little bell. I hate that they're not down here in my little country that I made. And I want to build a porch up there where I can stand and look at all the stuff I made. So he makes some of his cronies go and move them. But that night when they knock on the door, the old couple doesn't wake up because they're old. Yeah. And then they go in and they try to like touch him and wake him up. And the old couple dies of fright. Aww. And in the struggle with a random traveler that was also in the house, they knock some of the embers on the floor and burn it to the ground. Jeez, wow. And they go back to Faust and Faust had, had originally. You couldn't just like eminent domain that thing. I mean, well, that's the thing. He's, he was going to force them out and into a greater right. thing on his own land. He had a bigger house prepared for them. Right. But, but he accidentally home. killed him, and it's he said, home. you know, I, sh- I shouldn't have done that. And that is the first remorse wow. we see of Faust. It's the hmm. first time he ever thought Really? That he didn't feel so bad do. about Gretchen but, and yeah, Baby? Gretchen. No, we didn't ever really get any solid remorse from hmm. him. Wow. And, and then he... So in, in that feeling, there's a, there's a few evil spirits that visit him. There's care and uh, debt. Is care like need. worry? Is yeah, mean, care, okay. like worry and need and debt, and I think there was one more, but but all all three of them leave except for care. Care stays, Man, worry I wish stays debt with would him. Leave. That's yeah, right, exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's rich. He oh, doesn't God. he doesn't have any needs. He doesn't have any like debts that he has to worry about. They gotcha. can't get into his castle, but worry can. Hmm. And on quickly on the heels of worry is coming death, and we know this. And so she. He kind of sasses her and he's like, I'm not going to, I'm never going to worry. Get out of here. And she says, well, I'm going to blind you. So she blinds him. Mm. And then he walks outside and what he hears, he thinks he hears them digging a trench to drain this swamp to, you know, further his kingdom. But what he is actually hearing is Mephistopheles digging his grave with some skeletons. Wow. And he comes out and he's like, man, I love that sound. I can't wait to be satisfied in all the work that I've done in my giant kingdom. Man, I, I've done so much. I wish this moment wouldn't end. Uh oh, and that's it. The right? Skelly he, boys are coming for you. And he goes stock still and dies. Oh, just like that. Wow. Just like that. The wow. moment he said, "Let this moment stay." It is so beautiful. He he kicks it. Yeah. And then Mephistopheles rallies the troops and he's like, "All right, boys, we got to make sure his soul doesn't get away. It used to be really easy. They popped out right away, but now <laughs> you kind of got to wait for it. It could try to get out through the navel. Okay. So he, he brings a whole bunch of devils from uh-huh. underneath and he's like, all right, you fat little ones with the straight horns, you stand around the navel and you long fellas with the crookedy horns, you stand over here and we got to watch. And then angels come down, scatter a bunch of rose petals that burn all the demons and the demons all run off. Okay. And then they, the angels grab his his spiritual essence mm-hmm. and start heading off. And Mephistopheles... Well, that's not fair. He was like his big jerk bag his whole life. Mephistopheles, and he was. You're right. Faust was not a good not a good person. Right. Mephistopheles is like, I've been cheated, but who am I going to appeal to? Right. Like God or Satan? Satan will get mad and God isn't going to give me my due. And so he's just mad and he's mad for a second and then he kind of has some uh, physical feelings for the angels. He's like, dang, angels, you guys are cute. You want to... Just send me a, send me a wink. Come on. Just a little, like he starts trying to flirt with the angels. It doesn't go very well for him. And then Mephistopheles, or sorry, uh, Faust ascends to heaven with, while meeting a few spirits, he meets some anchorites, some, some Christian fellas. He meets a bunch of unborn or uh, like unbaptized children, Mm -hmm. children that were, were dead before they could grow, you know, to, to have sinned and a bunch of repentant women. And one of them is Gretchen. Oh, that's good. Wow. And so Gretchen becomes one of the spirits that gets to usher him into heaven. And the why does re- he get to go to heaven? That's what I was going to ask. The yeah. reason he gets to go to heaven is because he, of all of his, he is like the example of human striving. He has been striving his entire life. And so this is where we get to discussion. So in the, the drama of Faust, there is, there isn't so much good and evil as there is inaction and action. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Right. And guilt is not the thing that drives us to redemption. The thing that drives us to redemption is our striving. It turns out that, that the journey is the, the point all along, right? The journey is the quarry. And as an example of human effort, right? He is, he is the absolute pinnacle of artistry, right? Expressing himself in artistry is, is the thing that allows God to redeem him. And we knew this was coming. In the very opening scene, God said, he is going to lose his way. 
I will save him still, right? And so he gets raised up. And that is that is one of the themes is action as salvific. Yeah, it's a little too like Protestant work ethic-y, German Protestantism, work your way. Like just by being industrious is the virtue. It's But, but he's doing good. His industry is directed towards something good, I guess, is what they're also saying. It's not just that he works really hard. Like Mephistopheles works really hard, but he's still a demon. In yep. the end, he was working for the good of people. What, making that kingdom? With, mm-hmm. the, with the ocean thing? Is yeah. That? Okay. He wanted them to live free of care and protected, okay. right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, again, um, I f- feel like the parts that are most obvious about Faust's life are the horrible things. Again, like Gretchen, like what he did to Gretchen stands kind of at the f- front of it all. But even Gretchen forgives him at the end if she's one of the souls ushering him in. Yeah, as he as he rises, they sort of knock off all of the little bits of reality that still cling to him. And so he becomes sort of this pure spirit. I suppose maybe I could be persuaded if that moment of satisfaction he has at the end of his life is a moment of satisfaction because he's satisfied because he's created something that is serving the good of a community. Maybe. That feels like a stretch. Though. It does feel like a stretch. I mean, the reason he wants to build his little platform is so he can look over all of his domain. Yeah, that's not cool. That's right? happen- That's like Nebuchadnezzar, and he got turned to a donkey for it. And the very, the very last line of the book, let me pull it up here really fast. It's been argued about for forever. Five in the palace, deep night. Mm-hmm. So the very last, last line... All that is changeable is but reflected. The unattainable here is affected. Human discernment here is passed by. The eternal feminine draws us on high. They are following uh, the Virgin Mary up to Mm -hmm. heaven. So the eternal feminine draws us upward or draws us on high. And so that, as the last line of the book, that's been much debated. And I'm I'm inclined to think that it is the creative impulse, right? The feminine, Mm -hmm. that which can create. And so... With with different manifestations of poetry all along, right? Poetry is the thing that pulls him during the carnival. Poetry is like his son is the manifestation of poetry, right? He's the spirit of poesy. And so he, he like jumps up and down and loves warfare and takes all these crazy chances and is short lived, but eventually turns into a meteor that shoots into heaven, right? And so that creative impulse, that uh, expressing ourselves in art is the salvific thing. It feels very romantic. Mm, it sounds very romantic. It's it's very much romanticism, except... The, the, the idolization of youth and... Um, the only thing that doesn't feel like romanticism to me is the humanity in contrariness to nature, right? It is... At the end, he is subduing nature rather than living in harmony with it. Yeah, I yeah. wonder if that's... I don't know much about German romanticism, but I wonder if that's a hallmark of it, as opposed to like the British romanticism, which is we got to go and like live in our little our little hobbit holes in nature and just let it let it um, work its way through us. I wonder if this is a a version of that, which is um, it's less about living in a rural setting, but more about having that sort of passionate, creative. A uh, spark of energy is the is the romanticism as opposed to the natural rural setting, which is more typified in the British romanticism. Yeah. One other interpretation of why he got saved is that he finally has come to understand love. He didn't up until... Like the little old couple? Little old couple? No, what's the love he finds? Uh, I think it is love for man in general, mm. right? He finally has lost his ennui and found a love for the human experience, whereas Mephistopheles never understands love. He mm. never... He never gets it, right? Up until the very end, he is preying on Faust. Mm-hmm. And he has this moment of remorse also at the end. So I don't know if it's portrayed as repentance, but something in him is that's saying, true. Uh, you know, some, so, something that I've done is wrong. And he regrets that. So I, I don't know if there's something there too. I'm also wondering, because the other side is that he has looked for satisfaction in all of these other things and they've all failed, right? So yes, he's had a life that has strayed, but he also kind of rejected each one of those steps along the way, right? He rejected youth wasn't enough to satisfy him. Love wasn't enough to satisfy him. It Even was, love with the most perfect, beautiful yeah. woman. Like he had Helen, right. he had Helen of Troy yeah. and a perfect child who is the embodiment of poetry. And yeah. that's not enough. Yeah. Right. He didn't even say during those moments, let this moment stay. It was a moment of like actually doing like manual work basically. Right. Uh, maybe he's doing it. I don't know how he's moving the, 
uh, digging the trench. Water, yeah, exactly, it's it's like big, magical. I think it's big stone dikes plus magical. Yeah. But effort. it's him. It's him sort of working on a yeah some sort of project that is going to benefit lots of lots of people, and he's having this sort of satisfaction of doing that thing. Again, it's it's he's not. Yeah, is is he being saved because he has some kind of moment of the emptying of self or the emptying of ego, and he's giving himself to other people? I don't know. Did, did you get that sense and just like how it was written and how it was? No, it didn't. He didn't seem concerned that much for other people, mm-hmm. other than that he wanted to create this Edenic place for them. I was also wondering if the salvific thing, harkening back to one of our way old episodes, is that it is almost impossible for man to redeem himself. Mm-hmm. Right. He what he was looking for was satisfaction and he couldn't he couldn't do it. Gretchen couldn't do it. Helen, who is the wedding of what is it like peace and beauty can never be wedded together. You can never be happy and be beautiful at the same time. Um, You're telling me. (laughs) So so all of these things point to like humans just can't get there. And so God will save us anyway. Maybe it seems to be the message like there's no chance like all your own effort is useless. God will save us simply because we are human. But I, I don't know if that's a, an accurate interpretation or not. I know that there's also underpinnings of the modern the modern canon interacting with the ancient canon, right? We have two primary women here, and one of them is from the ancient, ancient Greece, and one of them is modern mm-hmm. and simple and pure, right? And of the Christian mm-hmm. background. So are you, are you, you're comparing Helen to Gretchen? or you Yeah, Helen about, and Gretchen. Oh, because there's also... Um, uh, Mary at the end. Uh, I don't, I, but is that the first time that she's brought in also? The only other time she's brought in is when the, Gretchen cries to her is when Gretchen yeah. cries to her after realizing she's pregnant. And then Gretchen will actually speak to Mary again in okay. a, in a conversation, almost mirroring her first uh, lamentation sure. in a positive way sure. uh, at the rejoicing Mary as they sort of ascend to heaven with all of these children. But just to make sure I'm understanding when you got to the end, this was a surprising end for you. You didn't expect this to be how it happened. I didn't expect it to be so vague about why he was admitted into heaven. It seems like what it is is a goofy trick by the the angels. They just come down and they're like, oh, this is ours, yoink, and they don't even really explain it. Sure. But is it that he's retained some sort of like fidelity to striving for an actually satisfying thing and he's not getting, um, he's not just sort of like giving in and being like, oh, okay, maybe, you know, I guess Helen. Maybe, and I think it may be, it's maybe even hinted at in the beginning when God is speaking with Mephistopheles, like, he will strive, he will lose his way, but I'll bring him back, mm-hmm. right? In the original wager that Mephistopheles had with God. I just can't help but think about, and I'm, I'm, this may take us in a too, diff, too far afield, uh, a similar kind of passage in Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, where a Marmaladoff, who is sort of this good-for-nothing drunkard in a bar, has this big, long speech saying that, because of my long, because of my suffering, self-imposed suffering or self-inflicted suffering, but suffering nonetheless, God will see me and take pity on me and save me. It's almost like uh, Faustus has this, because of my like eternal hunger for the perfect moment, and I'm not going to let myself be satisfied with anything less than that, then that's going to be the, the saving grace or the saving thing. Um, I don't know. It just sort of, it it strikes me as it has this like, that, that same kind of flavor of, I can't do it myself, but I also can't like enact it in any way. All I'm going to do is just kind of like, I don't know, maybe he doesn't have that moment of throwing himself at God's mercy, like meant like uh, Marmaladoff does in Crime and Punishment. But there's just something about the, um, about, yeah, that's, that strikes me as, as it's, it feels like a similar kind of problem to the Christian reader. The, all anyway. throughout this book, I was wondering, okay, what does Goethe himself believe? Right. Because I tried to look that up, mm-hmm. and every report I got about it, some said he was an atheist, some said he was a humanist. Apparently, according to him, sometimes he would say, I'm non-Christian, or I am a Christian, mm-hmm. I just don't like the church. or and, and so I was trying to figure it out this this whole time, and I can't do it. It seems like he's some odd mix of anti-church, mm-hmm. because the church never looks good, pro-human, mm-hmm. right? Because Faust is sort of the, I mean, you could only call him the pinnacle of human experience. The, he is this, the energy, the... the... He, yeah, he is, our, he is our id, right? Mm-hmm. He, wants, he wants everything. And he eventually gets to the point where he has experienced everything. And it's, so he is... Desire. He is, yeah, the yeah. great, 
he's the great poetic human, right? Mm-hmm. He not only has just written it, but he has lived it. He has lived all the poetry you can live. And Which so it makes sense this, why they would really why they would really lionize Byron in there because Byron also has that reputation of being right. that kind of guy. Yeah, that he's he's just this like absolute epitome of human artistry and living, and that is what God cherishes about us is human in his like. It almost feels like Pokemon, human in his final form, right? <laughs> okay. Like he is, he is, oh, he, he is evolved. Oh God, okay, that yeah, yeah, sense. Yeah, 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 write it all okay. in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna like you know a little unevolved Pokemon. I want, yeah. I want Pikachu in his final form. And so, Faustus is evolving. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what it feels like to me is that that Goethe himself does believe in the church because whenever Faust would kind of draw doubt about the church, he's like, ah, God feels just like a force to me. Mephistopheles would be. Mephistopheles would be like, yeah, I'll tell you he's a force. So Mephistopheles knew the reality of the Mm -hmm. spirit, right? Right. Faustus would be like, well, you can take me to hell. I'm not even sure if it exists and it can't be much worse than the hell I'm experiencing here. And Mephistopheles is like, hey, I've been there. It's worse. Yeah. Yeah. Like you, you don't have to believe it to have it be there. So it seemed like there was a, a, a real spiritual reality, but at the same token, an undercurrent of humanism and, Gotcha. And artistry above all that was sort of suffusing the play, right? Guilt about things wasn't great. What was great was man trying to reach his highest heights, right? Whatever that was. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. There's there's this weird tension there where, Hmm. I don't know, maybe Goethe believed in God, but he also seems like a big proponent of humanism. Yes. And that's why that moment of satisfaction is from Faust uh, doing something excellent for humanity generally right? right that's the humanism at the end um yeah i guess just you you've probably said this before you do still even with the strange illusions even with the complexity in goethe's version you you prefer this version of faust to marlowe's yeah they're not even on the same really they're not even playing the same game and why like in what way what do you mean by that so one and then again, reader, you're probably wondering if you should read this. If you are just looking for something to read and have a good time, steer clear. This is not <laughs> this is not it. You will not have a good time unless yeah. you are willing to take this, do like maybe a scene a week, digest it, study it, have someone teach you, listen to a couple lectures. That I, th- I feel like that's the only way to enjoy this. It was it was hard. It was a mm-hmm. difficult read. It's not going to be easy, but it is. Yeah. There, there are layers of beauty here that reveal themselves as you read and as you realize, okay, this is what he's doing with meter. Here's what he's referencing. Here's how the gods play in. Like every single, it feels like everything I discover, it's almost like the whole buried treasure th- theme, right? Mm-hmm. I can dig down and the treasure is there. Right. And even on the surface, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. It's beautifully written. And I feel like I learned a lot doing it. It is, it is but it, this feels like a capstone project rather than anything else. When I first started this, I wanted to teach, teach it to our seniors. This isn't a book for seniors. This is a book for seniors in college, maybe master's degree students. Yeah. Um, but if you if you are willing to take the dive, I think it is one of the greatest works in the Western canon. That's great. Crazy. Yeah. That's high praise. It is. Yeah. Ah, cool. else? Yeah. I think I think that's it for me. Okay. Right like and roll. That. Well, then that means it's back to me. All right. So thank you all for listening to Classical Stuff You Should Know. You can find us online at classicalstuff.net. You can find us at, um, uh, you can email us at the guys at classicalstuff.net. You can, you've already heard us talk about Patreon. Uh, thank you. Well, just because I said it, thank you to uh, Canopy for their support of today's episode. You can find them online at canopy.us slash classical. Uh, thank you also to our patrons for their support in making this episode possible. You can become one of those patrons at patreon.com slash classical stuff. Thank you. Thank you both. All right, all. Thank you to AJ Graham. Thanks to me, guys. Cool, cool. Okay, good. We, so Thank you, Megby. Th- oh, thanks. I there it is. That. There it was. Okay. So I think <laughs> with that, it's time for us to sign off. Let's get out of here, guys. All right. Ciao. Okay. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Bye.